Long-standing tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran spiked this week after the kingdom executed 47 people, among them a prominent Shiite cleric. Joining us now to explain what's at stake in the row between the regional rivals, Shanna Stein, TVO's foreign affairs analyst, founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs, and Besma Momani, senior fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation and associate professor at the Balsali School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo. Happy New Year, everybody. Good to Happy have you New back Year here. Happy New Year to you. Besma, to you first. Um, the killing of this um, imam seems to have started the whole thing. Sheikh Nimr al-Nimr. Who was he? Well, he's not an imam. He's a, a cleric. Um, and he is a Saudi. I think it's really important because we've really, I think, seen a media coverage of him as though somehow he's a foreign agent uh, operating on behalf of the Iranians, and that's really not the case. He was really calling for the uh, uh, increasing the rights of Shia minority that count for about 10% of the Saudi population that really face a lot of discrimination and disenfranchisement. So therefore um, a political threat to the regime? Absolutely. Uh, I think that one of the things that he did that probably crossed the lines for the Saudis is that he called for the overthrow of the regime. He did follow up saying that he wanted it to be a peaceful overthrow, although I don't know really a lot of peaceful overthrows. But nevertheless, he was controversial in that he did really rile up a lot of young people, in particular in the Shia community in the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia, to demand for more citizenship rights, which is clearly something that I think is lacking, not just obviously in Saudi Arabia, throughout the entire region, and was, uh, I think, a, a very easy scapegoat to say that they were clamping down on a Shia protester. You know, the nice thing about doing this program is I learned something every day and you just taught me something now tell me the difference between an imam and a sheikh what have I gotten wrong here well, I think, in, I mean, for, for, for Shia Islam, the, the imam is, a, is an elevated form of a cleric. Um, and it really denotes that there's something very holy about that person. You know, this, in, in terms of who he was on the spectrum, he was a really not very well-known cleric. I mean, he's a, a scholar in that sense of Shia Islam. Um, he is well-known in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. But in the big global scheme of the, the Shia community, he was low-level. I mean, he really didn't have a lot of influence. Okay, in that case, Jan low level, not particularly well known over here, certainly. I agree with so that. So why man. has his death sparked such outrage? Well, it, and that's a really interesting question, in part because Iran, which sees itself, positions itself as the worldwide defender of Shia, um, sees this as execution not as the Saudis executing a Saudi citizen, which is what it is, but as the Saudis deliberately discriminating against a Shia and against the Shia minority. And not only that, as Basma said, yes, he called for the overthrow of the Saudi regime, but he did not advocate the use of violent means. So this was, uh, unlike most of the others who were executed, the other 43 who were al-Qaeda, accused of being al-Qaeda operatives or al-Qaeda sympathizers, uh, Sheikh Nimr was not, and that's what provoked the outrage. Now, the Iranians went too far, and that's the other interesting side of the story. They torched the embassy, as you know, mm -hmm. and we got a series of statements after that that, to me, were really interesting. How so? So, both Ayatollah Khamenei and President Rouhani said, we regret the torching of the embassy. Compare that to the reaction when students seized the U.S. Embassy in 1979. They didn't right? say that back then. They did not say <laughs> that back then. Mm -hmm. So this is a story of a government that's evolving. They're saying, we get the fact that there are rules in international politics. We know our crowds broke it. We hate what the Saudis did, hmm. but we apologize. We're sorry. Is there any reason to believe that the Saudis miscalculated here thinking that they could execute this guy and essentially get away with it and there wouldn't be any reaction. Is that reasonable to assume? I think the Saudis knew what they were in for and probably, A, don't care or really like this attention. It allows them to play to a domestic audience that is going under, undergoing right now serious economic reforms. We just got a, a full pledge of privatization, putting in value-added taxes. Uh, there's going to be a lot of economic change happening in Saudi Arabia. Because you know, we're talking about Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's the key thing here. Revenue has gone down and you have a society that basically lives on handouts. It's a welfare state, a generous welfare state. 
state that now has to seriously contend with the reality of a real de de decline in income. And so how do you divert attention away from that? I mean, it, literally the day before the announced execution of Nimmer, there was an increase doubling almost the increasing of oil prices at the gas pump for an average Saudi. Now, if you're an average Saudi who already, by the way, there's a lot of poverty in Saudi Arabia, feels as though there is a class system where if you're a part of the royals, you get this enormous amount of benefits and the low life, uh, low level people who are the majority are not going to have that um, that income style or that that, that uh, 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 revenue. This is going to be a really great diversion for the Saudi government. How much, in your view, is this about Shia Sunni? How much of this is about the price of oil? I think it's both. Uh, and, and just to back out one bit, it's the Saudis who have kept the price of oil low. They've <laughs> flooded the market. They, there was an alternative way to go. They could have cut back on the export of oil, and as they did traditionally. They were always the balancer in the cartel. This time, they didn't do it, and they didn't do it partly in anti for two reasons. One, they're worried about the US, an exporter, seizing market share from them. So, and US oil producers certainly know that. But the other big issue, Steve, is Iran is going to come on stream now in the next year. Uh, its oil is going to be sold in international markets. Uh, the Saudis do not want to give the Iranians the benefit of a higher price of oil. Mm -hmm. So I would say, how much of this is the price of oil? I would rephrase your question. How much of this is Saudi Arabia Iranian strategic rivalry uh, in the Gulf for who's going to make the rules and who's going to follow them. That's a big piece of that's this. That's not religion, though. That's no, geopolitics. That's geopolitics. A big hmm. piece of that is geostrategic and geopolitics. So let's not simplify this as simply sh as Sunni Shia. As only Sunni Shia. Okay, exactly. gotcha, gotcha. Let me read this. This is from the New York Times. Toby Craig Jones, mm -hmm. history professor at Rutgers, who wrote the following. The real problem is not just that Saudis are willing to live with violent sectarianism, they are now beholden to it too. That the kingdom's leaders have embraced sectarianism so recklessly suggests that they have little other choice. This should be frightening, considering more is likely to be in store, but it should also be clarifying for those who believe that Saudi Arabia is a force for stability in the Middle East. He says it is not. Besma, your reaction? Well, I mean, the article was fascinating uh, throughout. I encourage people to read it. It really was, and, and Toby Jones is a real expert on it. Look, I think the, the reality is the Saudis are uh, trying to, to really increase their, their regional presence and, and their dominant power in the region by using the Sunni sectarian language. And it's really a shame, and we see the same thing with the Iranians. The Iranians are, are trying to do the same in, in terms of claiming that they somehow have the, the legitimacy to represent all Shia, including Shias in Saudi Arabia, right? Mm. Uh, look, this is uh, obviously going to be, I think, uh, a real sad point for where there is proxy conflict between the Iranians and the Saudis, and that's Yemen today and Syria, because they're the civilians that are going to pay the price of this challenge between the Iranians and the Saudis. You know, we know that uh, this is a, like a Cold War classical situation where they're not going to fight each other directly. What we're going to see is an, is an increase of that proxy conflict in the two countries that matter most today, where we see this heightened at an enormous pace. 250,000 people killed in Syria, 6,000 in Yemen, and really destructive, destructive scale of, of atrocities going on there. And frankly, no real party in the middle or in a, a point that can be a broker and put these two parties to back to the to their original state. I was just looking at the jumbotron over your shoulder here because obviously Syria to the north, right. you can't see the southern border of Saudi Arabia, which is Yemen, where so much of this, right. and there's a long border there. It there is a long border. It is, and Saudi Arabia for, you know, has always had their eye on Yemen. It's their soft underbelly. So their this eye is on it their... means what? Well, this is not the first time they've fought a war um, in Yemen. Uh, they, they fought uh, a losing war for 10 years with President Nasser of Egypt. Um, so they see this as really their area of great vulnerability. They will fight to the bitter end here to preserve what they consider um, you know, some sort of strategic depth on this kind of thing. You know, one other thing we should add uh, when we're talking about Saudi Arabia right now is we have a change in, in the king. <laughs> and the king changed the secession, mm -hmm. King Salman. He has a new minister of defense, Mohammed bin Naif, but most important, his, his son has been elevated to a position of responsibility, Mohammed bin Salman. And 
The general sense among experts, Steve, is this is a very different royal family than the one that mm. preceded it. It is much more aggressive, much more willing to use force. Uh, and who makes these decisions in the end really matters. I'm going to pull a little bit of an audible here. That's a sports term, Besma, because I know how much you love sports. <laughs> it's a football term. Uh, this isn't on the question sheet, but it's, it's just something that popped into my head. There's there, a small Canadian angle in this story. There is. Insofar as the, the Justin Trudeau government is now going ahead with this contract that was signed by the Harper government to provide what he's calling jeeps. They're not jeeps. But which are really mili you know, pretty significant military equipment. That's our part in all of this. Do either of you think we should be reevaluating that contract and not going through with it? Do you want to go first? Well, you know, I think that the reality is we're, we're going to go ahead with it. We, we've heard it already. The deal is done, as Stefan Dion said. It's yeah. done, it's done. Uh, the truth is, uh, look, I think if we're going to start being picky about the customers, which you could, on a, on, a, on a normative ground, you could say that's good, right? Look, the Chinese have killed 3,000 political dissidents. Right? So why are we doing business with them? There you go. Right. right? If we're going to really open that, that gate, right? Uh, the Iranians on their own have killed 600 or some uh, last year. D number third are the Saudis, but you know, the Americans are number fifth. I mean, like, if we're really going to talk about executions, or if we talk about yeah. capital punishment, if we're going to go down that slippery slope, which maybe we want to have a conversation with about a national conversation about who we do business with, that's something that we need to think yeah. about. But in all fairness, this is not a question about who we trade with or do business with. This is a question about selling vehicles which have armored guns on them to the Saudi Arabian yeah. National Guard, not to the army. And the no, National it's, Guard it's, it's is the force that is used to protect the king and to keep civilian order. Hmm. So this is putting weapons with real firepower in the hands of guys who will use it against Saudi civilians. Now that has to be a problem. So it makes you uncomfortable, but would you it have canceled the contract? I wouldn't have signed the contract, let me well, put it to you that way. We are where we are, though. But we are where we are, and I understand, what, let me put it this way, I understand what a tough one this is for the Liberal government. The contract is advanced. The company that in London, Ontario has already started ordering and buying parts. Mm -hmm. We're way down the road here. But I think this is a cautionary tale. When you sell weapons to a National Guard, not to an army, that's a red, should be a red flag to everybody. Hmm. Okay. Back on the path here. Do either of you see this? Best must start us off. Do either of you see this Iranian-Saudi conflict of the past week heating up, uh, potentially leading to war? Directly, no. And I think there, are, you know, there are costs when you when you engage in a bilateral war. Um, that's not going to happen. But the proxy situation is definitely going to increase. And that's what's really sad. I mean, you know, Yemen has become a self-fulfilling prophecy of a sectarian war that didn't start off that way, similarly with Syria. And both of these parties are doubling down when they should look at this and the reality of both being a stalemate, both being, you know, tragic on a humanitarian level, mm -hmm. and no real gains being made on the ground. I mean, there are plenty of reasons for both of these parties to say, Time is to, to really negotiate and get out of this. But after these events of tit for tat, what we're going to see is actually an escalation and a really a doubling down. And that's really, I think, a shame. You know, you have to ask yourself, why did the Saudis execute Sheikh Nimr three weeks before the start of the Syria peace conference? They didn't miscalculate, Steve. That was they, intentional. Yeah, well, and we know they didn't miscalculate because they warned their embassies all over the world mm. to take additional precautions. So you've asked so, the question, what's the answer? The answer is they wanted to blow up the peace conference fundamentally. They are not comfortable um, with a negotiated solution. They want Bashir al-Assad out. They're committed to it, and they want to slow this process down. Mm. And without the Saudis at the table willing to make a deal, we're not going to get a deal. I'm wondering also, Besma, what America's play is here. Because on the one hand, obviously, very close relationship going back decades and decades with the kingdom. On the other hand, a recent, I mean, you want to call it a thaw? I mean, it's a thawing of sorts of yeah. relations with Iran um, over this uh, agreement that they've just come yeah. to. What do they do now? Well, isn't it? I mean, it's so ironic. I mean, there was a great... Uh, uh, a commentator that said something to the effect of, you know, here's John Kerry 
trying to shuttle diplomacy between the Iranians and the Saudis, but there's no real American diplomacy between the Iranians in the first place. I mean, it's really quite ironic. Um, look, I think the reality is of why this, this conflict is so, seems so intractable is that there are or is no honest broker who can do the kind of mediating. You know, no one, no position, no power, no country, no leader has the credibility with either side. And we're really in the situation, and I think Syria accentuated this, you know, situation where we've, everybody's been forced to pick teams. And you can't rely on either the Turks, the Russians, the Americans, or any other sort of what have been uh, previously thought of as being a as a potential mediator can really bring these two heads together to find a solution to this. I mean, the last round of Syria talks in December was a shouting match between the Iranians and the Saudis. And I have to say, one of the other things, too, is I, I agree with Janice completely that this was predictable, but also one of the reasons why I think the Saudis did this, too, was you had the assassination by the, the Russians of a very prominent uh, Saudi-backed mm -hmm. Syrian fighter, yeah, Alush, who I think was also initially going to be a part of the peace resolution to Syria in the first place, and here you have the, the Russians putting a hit on him when they'd all agreed that he was going to be a part of the, the post, perhaps, the post-government or post-Assad government in Syria. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of blame to be made, and I, I think Nimr and Nimr ended up being the scapegoat of a bigger geopolitical rival. What do you see as America's play here? Well, you know, it's really interesting, because who would have predicted this? Um, we always all get it wrong, just as often as we get it right. John Kerry has a better relationship right now the foreign minister of Iran yeah. than he has with the Saudi royal family. Who would have? How bizarre is that? How bizarre yeah. is that, right? Hmm. So what you know from the Obama administration, not what they're saying publicly, but what you know is they are so frustrated with the Saudis. They see them as obstructionists. The Saudis, there is no words for what they think of the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. They think he's an incompetent ditherer. Uh, they're written them off entirely, and they're waiting for the next U.S. president. So it doesn't matter which American picks up the phone, they're not going to listen. So let me get this straight. The, mm -hmm. the Saudis, the Israelis, the Palestinians, the Syrians, they're all united in their belief that Obama's a disaster. That's right. The person who doesn't think so <laughs> is the foreign minister of Iran. Of Iran. Right? Now, if somebody had said that three or four years ago, that would have strained credulity beyond any limit. It's a funny world. Well, we know it's a funny world. Zarif and, and Kerry have built a really interesting friendship. Personal I mean, they, yeah, yeah. They've, they've been locked up in a, in a hotel together in Geneva for almost a year. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, they've gotten to be close. I think that's the reality of, of the day. You know, what's the U.S. play? Just to prevent either side from going up the ladder. That's all. Keep it right? at the proxy you level. Keep and, it at the, I okay. mean, that's right. So the sad part is the proxy conflict will continue, but the CARES job right now is to make sure that nobody, ta nobody takes the next step directly between do, one another. Do either Iran or Saudi Arabia want to take that next step? No, I don't they believe They don't, actually. No, I don't believe no. there is. Unless we, you know, you look at this with any degree of realism. Iran, strong, big country with a well-developed army and a well-developed paramilitary force, Saudi Arabia's not in the game. It's well, that's not what I was going to ask. Besma, uh, I, you, one hears about the strength of relative, the relative strength of different armies in that region. One doesn't often hear that Saudi Arabia's no. got one of the greatest armies in that no. region, right? Doesn't Is that fight. fair to say? No, I mean, it's got a lot of technical capability. I mean, it's got a lot of vehicles, a lot of airplanes, but not a lot of soldiers, not a lot of actual boots. And this is partly because the Saudi government's never really trusted its own people to have a very strong national army. That's yeah. not the goal. The goal is defensive as much, even very expensive hardware. I mean, there's no shortage of expensive hardware that many of the Gulf countries, not just Saudi Arabia, buy. And one way, part of that is to recycle a lot of petrodollars. But also, the other reason is because not only do they worry you know, increasingly about Iran, but they worry about their own people. Hmm. I mean, this is the reality. They worry and about their own people. You have Saudi young men who have an enviable lifestyle and buy their way out of the army and don't fight. Right. Okay, that's Iran versus Saudi Arabia. We've got a few minutes left here, and I just want to spend them with you talking about what is another utterly bizarre foreign policy story in the world this week, and that is, did they or didn't they? Did the North Koreans just set off a hydrogen bomb? No. Well, then why did they say that they did? Well, this is, first of all, not the first time that, um, that the inscrutable uh, ruler of North Korea has claimed military successes and military capacities that he doesn't have. Uh, but you said categorically, no, they didn't do it. That's right. How do you and, know? Well, how do we know? How do intelligence agencies all over the world know that it's no? 
because you need this, in order to set off a hydrogen bomb, you have to have the capacity. You have to be able to control the fusion process, and that is really demanding. In order to control a few, most of the atomic bombs are, are fission. This is a fusion process, which is much, much more demanding, Steve. And you need a component called lithium deuteride. There is an intelligence agency in the world that thinks the North Koreans have uh, that capacity. But surely if you've let off a bomb. No, what did they do? Okay. They enhanced their atomic bomb, right? So this shows you that their capacities are growing and we have to be, we have to take this very seriously and worry about it because what they did apparently explode and it's gonna take weeks to get really accurate information. I should say that, but what they did explode is an enhanced atomic bomb, five times more powerful, likely, than an atomic bomb explosion. Then, so, then say Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Yes. That, oh, five yeah. times bigger than that. Five times. So they've gone. They've gone up the ladder in terms of their capacity, and they are working toward uh, the capacity to produce a hydrogen bomb. Now, this has to worry everybody in the world. This is an isolated regime with, frankly, a leader, to the best of everybody's knowledge, um, who you know, kills advisors with impunity, inscrutable to the rest of the world, um, this is everybody's nightmare, frankly. The other angle that we're hearing on this is that it's a massive slap in the face to the Chinese. It is. Now explain why that would be. Well, because the Chinese have been going increasingly alarmed by North Korea's behavior. They have weighed in very, very heavily and said no further nuclear testing. In addition, the North Koreans are doing two other things that are worrying everybody. One, they're developing a significant missile capability. So they are, if, if they don't have it now, they are literally at the threshold where they will able, be able to send a nuclear armed missile considerable distances. So they become a regional threat. La launched from land or subs or what? Launched from land, land? at okay. this point, to the best of our knowledge. And the third thing is they're exporting missile technology and nuclear technology. Hmm. You know, the Syrians had a nuclear plant that was sold to them by the North Koreans. So hmm. when you put these three things together, it's, this is, as I said, everybody's nightmare. The Chinese have tried to restrain them Nor the North Korean regime would implode in a day if the Chinese government shut down the trade. So why don't they? Why don't they? Because even worse than this nightmare for the moment for, China, for, the, for the government of China is a regime that implodes. Hundreds of thousands of refugees um, flood over the border into China. Um, no sense of by the way, who would control the nuclear arsenal hmm. if the regime imploded? In other words, there's no orderly way out of this for the Chinese or for the South hmm. Koreans. It's a messy world. It's a frightening world. That, that is a frightening hmm. story. And this is the fourth test. Um, the world has been unable to stop them. Hmm. And that puts in context, I think, for everybody, the importance of the deal with Iran, where Iran has walked back for at least 15 years. Hmm. Okay, we'll leave it there. Besma Momani, Janice Stein, thanks for coming into TVO tonight and helping oh, us out with welcome. this. you're welcome. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.